Darius Aria for the American Institute for Roman Culture. This is Ancient Rome Live. Today we're going to be talking about the life and afterlife of the Colosseum. So this is the world's greatest amphitheater. This is the great iconic symbol of Rome and of Roman Empire, ancient Rome. Let's take a look at its history and then let's talk about what's in store for the monument in the coming years. There is an ongoing uh, conservation project funded by Todd's, which moves forward, which is guaranteed to give more access and better understanding of this, the greatest amphitheater from the Roman world. Hey there guys in Chicago. Thanks everyone for joining in. Sometimes, I don't know, we get spotty uh, Wi-Fi or we have Zoom outages, but here we are. So the Colosseum is behind me and I'm gonna be sharing some images. Now this, one second. Here we go. Okay. Okay, so what we're taking a look at today, what we're discussing today is the Colosseum. First, just a couple little points. There was something here before. It was the lake of the Domus Aurea of Nero, who's the emperor, the last of the Julio-Claudians reigning. So one of the great genial moves that Vespasian, who's going to succeed him in the year of the four emperors, is to drain out that lake that was used for private enjoyment and entertainment of Nero and give that space to the people. It's a space that actually is known as today the uh, Colosseum Valley. It was already known in antiquity with very many important uh, Roman monuments and shrines, particularly lining up against the Palatine Hill uh, in this photo, then behind me taking the picture and to the right. So it was a way of giving back uh, a big chunk of the city, over 100 acres of the Domus Aurea, uh, were uh, appropriated by uh, Nero, giving some of that land back to the people. Why not the greatest uh, venue uh, from ancient times? Now, there were previous amphitheaters in ancient Roman times, so we can go back and just basically in review. The first gladiatorial games are documented in Rome in 264 BC in the Forum Boarium. But by the second century BC, we hear about the gladiatorial games, these spectacles, as they're known. They're set up temporarily in the piazza of the Roman Forum itself. And we won't have uh, a a proper permanent amphitheater in Rome into the time of Augustus. He doesn't build it. It's built by one of his friends and supporters, Statilius Taurus, somewhere in the southern campus Martius. So it takes a while to get a stone amphitheater in the city of Rome, in part because the Romans don't like huge entertainment venues to be permanent where people can gather and potentially outshine one another politically so there's a reason why in the Republic, they build them temporarily. Most famously, let's have uh, Gaius Scribonius Curio in 53 BC builds a double theater, two theaters coming together to form that circle. And that's what the word actually means, double theater. But because it has a well-established uh, practice and location in the Roman Forum, then it's in the Roman form that we get that elongated shape, which then defines all amphitheaters, over 250 of them throughout the Roman Empire. So that real unique shape, that a perfect circle, is determined by some of the early games where people were fighting, performing in the long rectangular piazza of the Forum, and then you had the bleacher seats surrounding it in a kind of an ellipse or oval-like shape. That will then determine the shape of all successive amphitheaters when they become a permanent. And the oldest stone amphitheater that's preserved with certainty is the one in Pompeii after it becomes a Roman colony during the social wars. 
and this becomes a colony established by the general Sulla. And we date that uh, amphitheater there, known as Spectacula, place for spectacles, to about the mid 70s BC. So there is a long life of amphitheaters in Rome, but the first permanent one we can date to about 29 BC, Satilius Taurus. Then we can turn to, uh, we have notes of a, of a wooden amphitheater being built by Gaius, otherwise known as Caligula, near the Septa, the Septa in the circus, in the uh, Campus Martius, that's abandoned by Claudius. Then we have an amphitheater of Nero built after the fire of 64. So the idea is the records show that the stone amphitheater of Satilius Taurus had been destroyed. Here's a magnificent one, some people say not so magnificent, of Nero, made of wood. End of Nero, it's time for something new. What a big, bold statement. A new stone permanent amphitheater for the city of Rome. Here it is. Not known as the Colosseum until much later. It's known throughout antiquity as the new amphitheater, to distinguish it from the previous ones. It's known as the Flavian Amphitheater, named after the, fa the family name of Vespasian who built it. So we'll take a look today just briefly at the Colosseum and some very recent images, literally even taken just a few days ago. And we can see the facade here that uh, brings it up to almost 50 meters in height. The solid block stones of travertine have been cleaned. And this is part of the phase one of the conservation project that's sponsored by Todd's. You see in the distance, the Arch of Constantine, the magnificent Arch of Constantine, will be able to address it in the near future. And the big hole in the front, where there's that sign that says Domus Aurea this way and entrance to the Colosseum this way, that's Metro C. So that work continues today. So it's a busy hub. It's the juncture point now for Metro B, which literally runs from the vantage point of where I'm standing taking the photo, and then straight through underneath the, uh, the Arch of Constantine on its way to the Circus Maximus, on its way to the uh, Porta Ostiense, and the Pyramid of Cestius, so it's known as the Pyramide Stop. So again, we've had some breathtaking views as Rome uh, loosens up and, and we're allowed to travel around. We get incredible views and vistas. And in this case here, we see that section of the exterior wall of the Colosseum that is beautifully cleaned as well as it can be cleaned. And I'm gonna give you a little insight on that process uh, just shortly. There are some tours still, mo just local at this point, but you can see how everyone still admires the incredible work that was done in this long-term conservation project of the Colosseum. Now here's a vantage point. I'm going to be taking you up, up, up in the scaffolding to give you some great views of the Colosseum. Over the years, I've been allowed to go up to the Colosseum. So I'm gonna share some of those with you and then literally take you all around uh, the structure. So number one, as you can see, get a sense already of scale. Absolutely gigantic, monstrous structure. And uh, we've already talked about how it's replacing the Golden House's stagnum or lake in the time of Nero. Kind of move around here, turning around, I'm literally standing on the top wall of the Colosseum, you get a sense of the view, you get a sense of how high it is and then how small and low everything else is. This truly dominates the landscape of Rome. Uh, today there's the uh, Vittoriano Monument, in the distance you get an idea that you're about the same height. And we can see here that's the scaffolding that uh, I was up. And of course you can see the crowds that are at the current moment not here. But you can also see uh, just to the right of the scaffolding, you have a big wedge of brick arcades. That's one of two restoration projects done in the 19th century. In this case, this one here in 1827 by Villedier. It is an extreme effort to shore up that exterior wall still standing that it doesn't push out and collapse. So that is functional. It is in great shape 
and it gives you an idea over the years, over the centuries, what people have done to maintain this precious ruin. So we can see from this vantage point again from the top, we can see different series of tiers, and we can see the arena floor partially reconstructed. And beneath that Roman floor, that floor of the arena, is the substructures known as the hippogeum, where in the end, by the time of the mission and beyond, you have series of permanent wall structures inserted into which there are channels, corridors, and of course, elevator shafts to hoist up uh, props, animals, gladiators. So this truly is one great uh, forum space, you can say, for everyone of all walks of life to come and be entertained. So think about this as a grand arena. Think of the galleries. We'll talk about a lot of the uh, activities, but essentially it's a place to come together as a community and to watch order in a sense being imposed because you have criminals put to death at noontime. You have a horrific warm up act of men fighting against wild animals and the main event, the moon or these public obligations that are paid for by wealthy individuals, or in this case here, the state, only the emperor in this venue, you have the gladiatorial games of man against man fighting often to the death. And we can see a little bit of the neighborhood. I don't want you ever to think about this structure existing in a bubble. It did not. It was surrounded in this case here by a big temple, the temple of uh, Venus and Rome built by uh, Hadrian, rebuilt by Maxentius. But if you look down there at the base, you can see a bunch of large, dark niches where we're told in one uh, historic source, that's where a lot of the game's machinery that's used for the spectacles of the Colosseum were actually stored. And that gigantic space occupied by the Temple of Venus in Rome is actually the Valia, what we call the Valia Hill, if you come back to us looking at the hills of Rome. And then to the left is part of the Palatine Hill. Now I'm standing in the, uh, the temple of Venus in Rome, looking at the Colosseum, how magnificent it is. Again, the outer wall is intact on the left, the scaffolding's there in the middle, then you have the wedge of uh, restoring, shoring up brickwork of the 19th century, and then you have the inner ring, that is preserved. So as we make our way to the right, the outer wall is gone. It's fallen down in an earthquake sometime in the mid 14th century. The stone, think about that exterior wall of 100,000 tons of travertine stone. So much of it was carved away mostly in the Renaissance times and documented. So what was right next to the Colosseum? Again, I'm standing on the top wall of the Colosseum, almost 50 meters up. Where the trees are, that's where you had the base, this is verified archeologically, the base of the Colossus. Basically think that that was where you had standing a statue about the size of the Statue of Liberty, which in the time of Nero, we're told, was up on the Valia Hill by the Arch of Titus, moved here after the construction of the Temple of Venus in Rome by the Emperor Hadrian. So we can think about seating arrangements, four stories divided into four floors for 50 to 60,000 spectators. Everyone is arranged according to social class and that's gonna affect their social experience here inside the Colosseum. Again, there's a morning show, a noontime of executions and gladiatorial fights in the afternoon. The wealthy people traditionally went away at noontime to have a nice meal. The execution of criminals, burning them, throwing to wild animals, and so forth, was largely left for the rabble. It wasn't considered something for the upper classes. Okay, here, literally on the top wall of the Colosseum, you can see different layers of cement and consolidation work has taken place over the years, uh, but it was a great honor, a great opportunity to stand at the top, and I'll show you the view in just a little bit. But of course, again, the Colosseum, I just want to underline, was not 
in isolation. It was not in a bubble or a vacuum. It was surrounded by four gladiatorial schools. Right here, we're looking at the Ludus Magnus. There's also the Ludus Matutinus, the morning show, the Ludus Gallicus, Ludus Decicus, and there's an armory and a hospital and a morgue. So there's a lot going on on this side of what we call the Kylian Hill, partially excavated remains of the Ludus Magnus. So use your guiding star uh, gladiator. This is where Maximus was locked up in the movie, just in the shadow of the Colosseum. And of course, you won't see any of the scaffolding up now on the exterior. That conservation work on the exterior, phase one, is complete. I'm just making our way around the magnificent structure. The original circumference is 545 meters. That's the length of the Circus Maximus. And you got to think of the amenities, the bathrooms, the awning, the fountains, concession stands, souvenir stands, just as you would expect in any modern venue. We're making our way continually around here. We can see that when we look at the pavement, we can see where those white steps are. That's where the original exterior that has disappeared once went. We're looking now in some of the inner rings and the lower rings of the uh, Colosseum. The walls are peppered with holes where the metal clamps holding block to block has been extracted in the Middle Ages as people are foraging for building material. This was a great source. This was, as I like to tell people, Home Depot, but for free. But by the 1200s or so, the Frangipani family takes over this as a large fortification. What still stood could be reused. A lot of recycling history takes place later on in Rome's history. And it is amazing to think then that even as a ruin, a lot of things were going on here. Uh, in the Middle Ages, of course, people are still making a buck off the uh, Colosseum, ticket sales, and of course these centurions and gladiators have long since disappeared, but of course you can still visit the Parco Coliseo, reopening to the public after a closure of many months due to the pandemic, it's opening up June uh, 1st. So we think of this massive structure, 545 meters of circumference, almost 200 meters long, sometimes damaged by fire, and 217 was a famous one that put it out of commission for five years. It largely served most of its life as a ruin because the gladiatorial games ended in 434 and the animal hunts ended in 523. There's already a church documented being inside and burials already in the sixth and the late sixth century AD. And again, the French Pondit family takes over in about 1200. That earthquake, mid 14th century, tumbles down that outer wall so we can't see it in this photo, can't see it in this photo, but that white line that's traced in the pavement, shows us just how far out and how much of that exterior we are missing. It's a grand site, is a ruin. And of course, we jump inside, we might see the occasional cat. We do see the different phases of the hippogeum, the substructures for the wooden floor, here partially reconstructed, sometimes in ashlar blocks of tuff, sometimes in brickwork. And potentially with the new conservation work, the entire uh, floor will be reconstructed for more access to visitors. We don't know. Uh, I would say it's more probable than not. So enjoy this view while it lasts. And we can see from this vantage point again, the floor, how much of the hippogeum is exposed. Uh, later, if you look at it more recent times, I haven't put up any of the more recent photos, the actual hippogeum walls have been beautifully uh, restored and clean and consolidated, and they are now much more legible. Here's some reconstruction of some seating, which is incorrect because the seats at the bottom for the senators would have been much wider. And as you went up, then you got more closely uh, related to that nosebleed kind of seat, less comfortable, less showy, less visible. Of course, down at the, uh, at the bottom, you had the best views, and there was a guild of bronze fence and netting to protect you from being killed by uh, gladiators or wild animals. Here's a great view of the Colosseum and the uh, Arch of Constantine here from the Palatine Hill. I'm standing in the Vigna Barberini. It's a grand view from here. And from the top, standing and see how tiny those people are now on the 
on the pavement of the arena floor, we were very up high in D, the, the Castelli Romani, the Alban Hills where Romulus and Remus were born, and we're all the way at the top for, I think, a quite unique view. Of course, who knows when the scaffolding is going to be up next, so I consider myself pretty lucky to have gone up there a number of times. Currently, again, the restoration work, the Grand Conservation Project funded by Todd's is going to be concentrating, is concentrating on the interior spaces, the corridors, and so forth. They've made a lot of, of progress, and you'll notice that the next time you visit the Coliseum. So I want to thank you all. Let's see if there are any, uh, see if there's some questions. Coming right back. Hey, then Indiana, great Dana that this is your favorite topic. And Todd's T-O-D apostrophe S is uh, essentially a luxury brand that makes things like shoes and clothing and purses. And uh, David De La Valle, the owner and CEO, has uh, donated money over the past years going towards this. And it really kick-started Italian fashion brands to contribute to preserving the cultural heritage of Italy. It's been a great idea. Uh, it was a new idea at the time, now much more acceptable, much more current. Nobody's gonna question anything like this today, but he was a real innovator to do this. And I think they've seen a lot of great results. The ongoing uh, attention then will complete the conservation work on the interior. And then I think you're gonna see some work also on the outside piazza, even with a new kind of guest center, uh, information center and so forth, hidden out of view, but also another necessary step to accommodate people in a, having a better experience in the Coliseum. You can go underground, you can go up to the second tier, even the third tier. Uh, and, and of course you saw where I was, uh, if I just come right over here, I was right up there and brought you to the tippy top when the scaffolding was up. Just giving you some views of the Coliseum, the Grand Amphitheater, the New Amphitheater, the Flavian Amphitheater. Thank you very much for joining me for a little overview of the Coliseum, the structure, and the ongoing conservation work that is taking place Thanks for joining me here for Ancient Rome Live. You can support us. Just go to ancientromelive.org slash donate. We're a U.S. nonprofit, and we are conducting live webinars on site on Wednesdays and on Sundays, always from Rome, 7 p.m. Rome time. Thank you for your support.